Well, it's really great to be here and to be looking at this question. I want us to consider how we respond to objections that there are to the Old Testament, particularly in evangelism. We heard already uh, from Dr. Aiken about the use of the scriptures in small group Bible studies. We also heard about the importance of questions. Those are things we're going to have reinforced. The moment you start getting into small group Bible studies, one-to-one evangelistic Bible studies, some of these questions are going to be raised, and you sometimes even find that they're raised on the street. So I want us to uh, just have a little look at the outline, which is to begin by thinking, how does our Lord Jesus respond to questions, particularly focusing in Matthew's gospel there? And we're going to find how he uses scripture, how he uses questions, how he seeks consistency in the person he's talking to, and also seeks commitment. Then we're going to look at three tough questions in the Old Testament. One is the destruction of the Canaanites, one is the question of slavery, and finally the question of sexism, which are three um, areas that are often brought up when people object to the Old Testament. So let's just begin with the whole question of how Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, responds to questions. One of the things that we find when he uses Um, when he responds to questions is how much of scripture he uses it's not just that he does this when he responds to questions we find that he was doing this in his childhood in Luke chapter 2 we find that he's using uh, questions all of the time and in fact we find that when uh, Jesus is put under huge pressure he is using scripture. One of the times in what, under which he's in, under huge pressure is, of course, the temptation. And what is he doing each time when he responds to Satan in Matthew chapter 4? He quotes scripture. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you look at the three different responses he gives to Satan, it's rather striking how few non-Old Testament words he adds. Now, of course, everything that Jesus says is inspired, so I'm not distinguishing between inspired and not inspired. But when we um, just put out uh, how many words come from the Old Testament and how many does Jesus add, we see that he only adds seven of his own words. Uh, So we've got it here. We could say that in his response to Satan, 81%, if we just look at word after word, and you don't need to know Greek to appreciate, the underlying bits are the words that he adds. The non-underlying bits are the bits he quotes from the Old Testament. We look at uh, Luke's parallel account. 85% of his response is uh, straight from Old Testament scripture. And that raises a question. If our Lord Jesus Christ relied on scripture... (laughs) Even though, of course, everything he says becomes scripture because everything he says is true. If he relied on scripture, how much more should we? From an early age, he was studying scripture. He was learning it. It, His father's word, he wanted to know it. He wanted, and and we, we, we can't psychologize all about that but we do understand that he grew in wisdom from Luke's gospel. So one of the key things that happens is he uses scripture. And he uses scripture because, obviously, there's a theology to that. If people are going to be saved, we know that faith uh, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And one of the things we need to realize in evangelism is that we mustn't get in the way of scripture. Sometimes, and I'm sometimes involved in apologetics, apologetics can get in the way of scripture. It's as if you're a little bit embarrassed about the Bible and what you want to give is instead of the Bible, you want to give people's arguments which support Christianity. Let's realize that apologetics is simply there in order to uh, prepare the way to lead someone to engage with Scripture. It's not actually to get in the way of Scripture, it's simply to get out of the way as soon as you can. We can, when we're involved in discussions, also incorporate Scripture into our answer. It doesn't have to look and sound like Scripture, but simply that the scriptural truths are naturally there. And I think that um, evangelists, uh, as, as we reach out, we naturally do this. And we're inviting people to engage and to hear and to read scripture. They may not be willing to read it, but you can at least often tell them what scripture says. So that's one very brief thing that Jesus does is use scripture a huge amount. I've just touched on it a little bit. He also uses questions. Now, whereas using scripture is mandatory, using questions is optional. It's not something there's any reason to suppose that we have to do. But it's rather striking that in Matthew's gospel, our Lord asks 90 questions. 
And when he is asked questions, he in fact asks 10 counter questions, which I just want to take you through rather quickly. The counter questions we're going to see are in yellow. So what happens in Matthew 9, some people say, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? If you're familiar with the Gospels, these next nine will, will just sound familiar. Which of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? A counter question, Matthew 12. Again, Matthew 15. And why do you break the commandment for the sake of your tradition? Again, people have asked him a question. He responds directly with a question. Uh, Matthew 19. There are, he's asked about divorce. He says, have you not read? that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Haven't you read it? Why do you ask me about the good? Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And, and so on. We've got a couple more to do if they click through. Um, the baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what it said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Why do you trouble the woman? So people ask him questions, and he doesn't feel his first obligation is to give a reply. He actually asks questions. And there's a pattern to some of these questions. Three of them we see, thrice he says, have you never read? Now, of course, he may be speaking to a a Jewish audience and sometimes an educated, scripture-knowing Jewish audience. Have you never read is also something he says thrice on other occasions in Matthew's Gospel when someone hasn't asked him a question, but just when he's speaking. But I don't think it's just something you can say to a Jewish audience, because after all, Paul says something rather similar in the book of Romans. It's speaking to uh, uh, the Romans, where there are many non-Jews, many Gentiles. He said, don't you know what the scripture says in Elijah? That's the passage about Elijah, says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel. And so I think um, one of the interesting things about saying, have you never read, is of course it rather implies that the person should have done. And although we don't want to go around um, judging people for their knowledge of scripture, I think sometimes creating a little bit more presumption that God's word is so important for the world that, well, haven't you heard it? Now, of course, you don't use that with unreached people groups. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am suggesting is that sometimes for us to uh, realize that um, uh, raising the profile of the scriptures and saying these are things that really everyone ought to be taking note of, that's uh, a thing to do. Another feature of his counter questions are why questions, but not just any old why question. They are why do you questions. In other words, they really are asking someone to give account of themselves. Why do you break the commandment of God? Why do you ask me about the good? Why do you put me to the test? It's the same sort of thing. So one in these counter questions, we're seeing one feature is really highlighting the scriptures. Another feature is really highlighting the uh, need for people to give account to themselves. Now, of course, unlike our Lord, we're not in a position of judge, but there is nevertheless this question of consistency. Why do you trouble the woman? Again, uh, this question of people needing to give it account for themselves. So we look at um, his counter questions. We see an appeal to scripture. We also see Uh, people are asked to explain themselves. And there, the principle underlying people's need to explain themselves is that principle of whatever um, judgment you have used on others will be used back on you, which we see in the Sermon on the Mount, and also similar rules understood in Romans 2. So that leads on then to this third feature of our Lord's um, discussion with others, and that is that he's seeking commitment. Jesus was once asked a theological question that went like this. Luke chapter 13. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Now, that's a very interesting question. And, you know, various theologians have actually written on that. There are those Reformed theologians who who would actually say that the absolute majority of people will not be saved. And there are those people like Warfield and WGT Shedd who would say the absolute majority will be saved. But the point is this. 
What does our Lord say when he's asked a question, will few be saved? His answer is, will you be saved? It's a much more practical thing. His answer is, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will uh, seek to enter and will not be able. So in other words, it doesn't actually answer the question, the abstract question of the absolute number um, or relative number of those who will be saved. It actually applies the question to the person who is speaking. So, will few be saved? The answer is make sure you are saved. And I think that's a very interesting thing because what it means is that our Lord is speaking in a context where he is asking for commitment. Now again, we can't ask people for commitment if we are not committed to them ourselves. That's very important. But one thing I have found when I'm dialoguing with people is to ask for commitment can be helpful. Sometimes you find that people just have an endless stream of questions. And this is where I have what I call in my mind the pre-answer contract. When someone asks me a question, I don't go straight off to answer them. I actually ask them a little bit more about their question. Sometimes what I do is I say, well, is this your hardest question or is this your most important question? Because actually those are only the, the, the two questions we're most interested in dealing with. The most important question, that really should be uh, very important by definition. The hardest question has some other implications. It may not be their most important question, but I think it's reasonable to ask for a commitment if you can answer either of those. So what we could ask is, what would you do if I gave you a good answer? You can ask, what would a good answer look like? Um, you can ask a little bit more, really get people to clarify, because what we're asking is not to just engage in some abstract dialogue. These are about things that really matter. This is about the gospel, and this is about life and death, and that is why we need sometimes to ask for commitment. And so one thing I might do is I might say, well, if this is your most difficult question, if I answer this, are you prepared to accept that in fact all of your other questions could be answered? Because logically, if it's their hardest question, that follows, doesn't it? Because there are some skeptics who just have an infinite number of questions. They have no intention of ever getting to the end of the list. On the other hand, there are some who are um, much more sincerely seeking, and we need to be able to sort between those two. Because there is a time sometimes to walk away and say, well, I don't think you're ready for this conversation. So that's one way that I would seek to do that. The other principle we found is how our Lord seeks consistency. Again, we read this in Matthew's Gospel. A man was there with a withered hand. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So he appeals to what they already do. Now I'm just going through that very briefly, those four things, using scripture, using questions, seeking commitment and seeking consistency. That's all that first preamble is. Because now we're going to try and dive in and apply some of those principles as we read through the Old Testament and we think of some of the really tough questions. The toughest question by far, I think, that people have as they read through the Bible is how can it be that God asks uh, his people, he asks Joshua to um, destroy the Canaanites and all sorts of problems arise with that. Uh, We can say, well, how can a loving God command the destruction of seven nations? What about the poor innocent children? Isn't that genocide? And if your God could command Joshua to kill people back then, couldn't he command you to kill people now? And that would be just the same as the suicide bombers, the terrorists, and so on. So you see, it's a very awkward question. And I think this is something that if we're involved in encouraging people to read the Bible, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, we want people to read the Bible, then we're going to have to be involved sometimes answering these sorts of questions. Well, how should we respond? One of the things we might do is we think, might think about the principle of consistency. Of course, uh, if they're so concerned about the killing of innocent people, we might want to raise the question of abortion. We might, on the question of 
commitment, say, well, okay, if I do answer this or partly answer this, what difference will that actually make to you? But what I want to spend most of our time on is not thinking through those principles of consistency and commitment, but actually doing the groundwork in studying what the scriptures say. So I'm going to look at about 25 or so principles uh, that um, are or facets of this command in order to understand what exactly is going on. I'm not going to give a complete reply, and arguably a complete reply isn't necessary. But what we find is a common atheist perspective, skeptical perspective, equates the Old Testament with two rather nasty things. On the one hand, religious terrorism. On the other hand, the sorts of genocide that have gone on uh, in um, the former Yugoslavia and went on in uh, Rwanda and so on. That's what people think. As Richard Dawkins puts it, the Bible story of Joshua's destruction of Jericho and the invasion of the promised land in general is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacres of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. So there we have a perspective that we have a Bible story that has no moral difference from what we find in the worst things that we know going on in our world today. However, When atheists look at this story, and I think Dawkins is fairly typical, he actually misreads the story. Because because he's an atheist and he doesn't believe in God, he actually factors God out of the story as he thinks about it. So he speaks as if God doesn't actually tell people to do something, as if no miracles are performed, there isn't a massive exodus, and then characters are judged in the narrative as if God hadn't actually told them to do something. That means that I think sometimes atheists factor out God from a story. They say, well, it didn't happen. But really, that's not a fair way of reading the Bible. When we're reading a story, even a fictional story, we have to treat that story with integrity. So I can judge the morality of the story of Harry Potter without thinking it's historical. And in the same way, when an atheist reads the Bible, they need to read who the character the main character in the Bible is, and you know the main character in the Bible is God. So if you're reading the Odyssey, you can't factor out Athene, who talks to Odysseus in Homer's Odyssey, because Athene is a real character in the narrative. And even for an atheist, God, they should recognize his real character. And we actually want them to read about this character and see who he is, not just simply to reject the narrative. So when we look at the story, we see, firstly, it's a miraculous account. And in the beginning of the story, the character God gives all life. We believe in a God who gave all life. That actually makes a big difference. Because when a person who has given all life says that you are to take it away, that's a very different command from someone who has not given all life. But that, we want to maintain, is an essential part of the scriptural story. What's more, according to the story, sin is not just an offence against humans, it's an offence against the one who gave all life and who owns all life. That's an integral part of the story. We can also say that we as Christians believe that sometimes different physical laws may apply from what an atheist thinks goes on in their universe. Let me explain. When we have the story of God telling Abraham to offer up his son Isaac. An atheist reads that and they think, well, you only ha- the only thing you have is life. So for someone to tell someone to take it away from someone else obviously must be the worst possible thing for them. But when you read the story of Genesis, you find rather different. You find that God has shown himself faithful to Abraham and God has already promised to Abraham that through Isaac there will be multiple offspring. Therefore, Abraham at the time of Genesis 22 knows that Isaac has to have some future existence. That's why he says to the two servants at the bottom of the mountain, the boy and I are going to come back. So I don't need to read on to Hebrews to find out that Abraham knew that God could raise him from the dead. I actually know from just reading Genesis that Abraham had to know that um, Isaac would have some future existence. Now that actually rather changes things. Now in most situations, if you cannot swim and someone asks you to walk out onto water, um, you know, where there's, there's a bit of a storm, it's not 
good a good idea to do so. In fact, you could argue it's irresponsible, even immoral to do so. However, when you're with the person who actually made the water, it's not irresponsible <laughs> to do so. So in other words, what would be irresponsible giving an atheist universe and atheist assumptions isn't the same within a theistic universe. We also believe that death is not the end or even the worst thing that can happen to you. We can also say that within the Bible, excuse the phrase here, there's something rather striking in terms of the epistemic warrant or reason to believe given to the people involved. So when someone tries to say that the story of Joshua is like a modern story of war, I want to say, well, have you read it carefully? Because in fact, what God does is he speaks to Joshua in a way which I don't know anyone has any reason to believe that they've been spoken to more recently. We also know that the story tells of God's proven character and great miracles, the greatest display of miracles, signs and wonders in the entire Old Testament took place at this time. There was clear speech external to Joshua. Now these things I'm heaping up are all essential to the biblical story. So what I think sometimes people are doing is they're not considering the biblical story as a whole, they're considering a bit of the biblical story. Now if they're going to reject the story, I at least want them to reject the story as it actually is, not as it isn't. Also, according to the story, I think you can make a strong case that Israel is in a unique position as God's judicial representative, and even within Israel's history, it is in a unique historical position that it never was again. Also, according to the story, God does most of the fighting. He's the one who makes the walls of Jericho fall down. He's the one who kills most of the Canaanite armies with hail. But then the question is, why did God? Scripture has a particular approach to why did God questions, which is to say that not all why did God questions can be answered. And, and we need not to think that we need to answer every why did God question. There's no reason, in fact, why it should always be answerable. Think of a three-year-old in the play park with their parent. Their, their parent realizes it's time to go and decides it, they need to you know, call an end to this wonderful time. At that point, the three-year-old doesn't believe that the parent has morally sufficient grounds to take them away. And so that means that they throw a tantrum. Uh, this has been witnessed on many occasions. Now, one of the interesting things is, I think in that situation, the three-year-old doesn't usually doubt the benevolence and love of the parent. I really think they don't. However, they do throw a tantrum because there's something they don't understand, because they don't believe their parent has morally sufficient grounds for their current action. They simply don't understand it. And so what I think we can do with these questions that are difficult to understand is we can say, I don't understand. It's also logical that I wouldn't understand because if God's ways are above our ways, God's thoughts are above our thoughts, he's infinite and all-knowing, why should I understand? And in fact, the fact that I don't understand doesn't mean I doubt God's benevolence. In the case of that three-year-old, they don't doubt their parents' benevolence because they have an awful lot of evidence of their parents' benevolence. So we are in the same situation with God. Also, I would say that omniscience makes rather a big difference to the morality of decision-making. Now, imagine you had omniscience for a day. It's a non-transferable attribute of God, by the way, so this is a slightly theoretical idea. Um, you might decide to go and live in Las Vegas or, or something like that, and, and to, you might well decide you know, that, that, that gambling had suddenly become very moral. Now, I'd want to suggest that gambling is a bad idea, and the reason why gambling is a bad idea is because we lack future knowledge. It's a bit like getting to the summit of a hill and uh, passing another car when you can't see what's going the other side. It's an immoral action... But it's an immoral action that could be moral if you did know what was down the other side. In other words, your knowledge can change the morality of an action. Again, let's go back to three-year-olds. You can have a three-year-old child. I've had a three-year-old, two of them before, um, not at the same time. And, and they like being played with. I mean, I used to take them as three-year-olds and I would throw them up in the air and they'd enjoy that. Great. Great. 
And that's a moral action. But it would be an immoral action if I didn't know I could catch them. <laughs> right? So what's moral or not can vary an awful lot depending on my future knowledge. If you knew what everyone here was thinking and doing, certain things that would otherwise be socially unacceptable, rude and wrong could be right for you to talk to them about. Do you see? Now, let's factor in the character we're talking about is God who has all that knowledge. So, of course, it's very logical, even within our very finite minds, that there should be things that it may be okay for him to do that are not okay for us to do. So, factor in that he made all life and he know all, knows all things, that can make a big difference. Now, all of that might just seem like, well, it, it, just a number of reasons that brush off you. But really, I think what's most important is to get to the divine character, who God is. You see, God reveals his intent. The beginning of the biblical story in which there is no violence and the end chronologically of the biblical story, such as Isaiah 11, where there is no violence, tell you God's in intent. God is sovereign over all things, but that does not mean that he stands in precisely the same relationship to all events. That is, there are things that the scripture will speak about him delighting in and things that he takes no pleasure in. That's significant. We know, according to the scriptures, that he has a trustworthy character and that there is some asymmetry in his character in regard to mercy and anger, that he is quick to be merciful and slow to be angry. That is not just a claim that's made in the biblical text, it's actually worked out within the biblical text, whereby, for instance, before Joshua can go in and drive out the Canaanites, the, there is a delay, a delay of hundreds of years where God says to Abram, the iniquity of the Amorites, who's a group of those Canaanites, is not yet complete. It's not yet bad enough. So in other words, it's not just that he claims to be long-suffering, it's also worked out in the narrative. Have you ever considered why so much of, say, a book like Jeremiah is about judgment? You might think, well, isn't it quite a depressing book? If God were one of those who just simply punished the moment someone did something wrong, Jeremiah would be an awful lot shorter. I mean, you've got to think about this. You know those books, um, and I don't want to make too much of a point about parenting here, but there is a certain style of book that talks about first-time obedience. Very important principle, you know, when you're raising children, that they learn to obey you first time, and, you know, if not, there are consequences and punishments. Well, God doesn't do first-time obedience uh, with Israel. In fact, he's very, very long-suffering. Sometimes, almost like a parent who says, don't do that, or I'll punish you, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and keeps on saying it. And, yeah, we're looking at the parents, we're thinking, well, why don't you go and do it? Well, of course, the parent doesn't want to punish. And there is that principle that God, of course, is completely completely just. He cannot be infinitely suffering. That would be unjust. But he is long-suffering. And what's more, there are many times before this in the Bible and after this in the Bible when God said things that seemed odd but were proven right. Now imagine a character who's often said odd things but has a good track record. Maybe think of a Warren Buffett. Uh, you know, it seems to be saying something odd but people have w worked out over the years that there's an awful lot of trustworthiness there. That, on an infinite scale, is what we have with God. And then supremely we need to recognise that we're not talking about God as someone unconnected with our world, we remember the incarnation. Now, the destruction of the Canaanites is the most horrific thing that goes on in the Old Testament, but it's a destruction because of their sin. Therefore, the destruction of a Canaanite, the Canaanites is a picture of how bad sin is. Therefore, the destruction of the Canaanites can give us insight into how bad sin is and therefore what Christ took on himself when he took the punishment for our sins. So in that sense, the destruction of the Canaanites, though it is so horrific, can give us some insight into the cross. And the fact that Christ suffered there on the cross means that we also know that it was not a command that did not have any analogy in what God himself would experience. We can also say 
part of the scriptural story, again, is the Canaanite wickedness. They rebelled against the person who had made them. They sacrificed their own children. And they were fully warned. Twice in the book of Joshua, it's very clear that they were warned. Uh, We know that because we think of the character of Rahab. Uh, Rahab says, we've heard all the amazing things that God has done, and uh, she has decided to change sides. And there's another occasion in the book of Joshua where you get the same thing said. They knew of the miracles that God had done. They decided to shut up the city of Jericho. And they weren't judged on the basis of their race. Again, we know that Rahab, who was a a Canaanite, switched her allegiance to God. Whereas Achan, who was an Israelite, switched his allegiance the other way. This is how... Uh, Rahab talks about what they've heard. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when he, you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God of, in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Well, if she can hear what God's done and come to that realization, then surely everyone could have heard and come to that realization. Now, some people would say, but it's just nationalistic propaganda, the Old Testament. You know, it's telling Israel's side. Actually, I don't know of any national literature that says as much negative about the people group from which it originates as the Old Testament. What we can say is the Old Testament tells you of the most proverbially wicked um, city in Genesis chapter 19, the city of Sodom. Later on in Judges chapter 19, you read of how an Israelite city of Gibeah is almost exactly the same. You read of one of the last kings of God's people, Manasseh, how he burns his children as sacrifices, how he does worse than the Amorites did. So in other words, it's not nationalistic literature. We can also say that according to the Old Testament, we learn something very particular about God's commands. That is, God can command you to do something that would have been wrong if he had not commanded you. Now, you might think that's a rather risky thing to say, but it's actually something very everyday. We we know that many people work in companies and have the authority to sign checks only if someone tells them you can sign that check. There are certain things you can do. I went through an airport, through a disabled part of the airport, because I was with a disabled relative recently. And I got into an airport, a part of the airport, that I wasn't authorised to be in unless I was with authorised personnel. So what would have been wrong became right because it was duly authorised. Taking someone else's life is wrong because you don't have the authority. However... If the author of all life gives you authority, it can be right. But he will only give that authority when he has loving and sufficient grounds and there are a whole number of aspects of this story that circumscribe it and make it very unique rather than something that we would expect God to be doing today. Also, although God can command you to do something that would have been wrong if he hadn't commanded you, he can't command you to do something inconsistent with his character. And within scripture, we learn that his character has absolute preferences. For instance, there are things in which he delights and things in which he takes no pleasure. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So it's not that any bad thing God can simply declare good. No, God can't lie. There's an infinite number of things that God can't do. I mean, at least things that you can say in sentences. Did you know? What it means for him to be all-powerful is for him to be powerful in doing everything that his will wants. Everything consistent with his character. But he can't make himself bad, lie, make himself not exist, make a stone too heavy for him to carry, etc., etc., etc. And there are some that go on in the philosophy classes. The point is this. That's not what it means for him to be all-powerful. It means for him to be able to affect his will powerfully. Then we need to say, when people are objecting, which of three objections are they making? Are they objecting that it was immoral for God to to command the destruction of the Canaanites? Well, if they are, they need to be able to show that there is no possible morally sufficient grounds whereby an all-knowing God could command this, an all-wise God. And of course, that's an impossible thing to prove. 
Then they might want to suggest that it was immoral for the Israelites to obey such a command if it really had been given in the way the Bible describes. But I think that's a very difficult thing to prove as well. The third thing they might try and prove is that the Bible today, or reading it, causes people to be violent. The problem with that is that in fact there are all sorts of things that might cause people to be violent that our secular society doesn't mind about. That's the consistency argument, all sorts of videos and things like that. We can also say that what if we could show that, you know, some writings, let's say, of Charles Darwin had led to a stream of history which actually had meant that some people had done some bad things. Would that mean that we would want to criticise the original writings? Most secularists wouldn't want to go there. But also, there just simply isn't empirical evidence to back this up. And of course, there's loads of evidence that of all the good things that have been done through people following the scriptures. So it seems to me that this is a serious objection to the Bible, but it's not a defeater. And of course, all of this does depend on the person you're talking to rather putting themselves in the situation of being judge over the whole thing. We would want to put in the biblical teaching that actually, although we might like to think of ourselves in the position of judge over God, the reality is that he is judge over us. Let's look more briefly at the subject of slavery. The problem could be put like this. The atheist Sam Harris says, in assessing the moral wisdom of the Bible, it's useful to consider moral questions that have been solved to everyone's satisfaction. Consider the question of slavery. The entire civilized world now agrees that slavery is an abomination. What moral instruction do we get from the God of Abraham on this subject? Consult the Bible and you will discover that the creator of the universe clearly expects us to keep slaves. Well, excuse him that word expects, because then um, Mr. Harris does something rather sensible. He quotes the Bible, and this is the text he quotes from the Revised Standard Version. As your male and female slaves, whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are round about you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their families that are with you, who have been born in your land, and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. You you may make slaves of them, but over your brethren, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with harshness. Now you can see some problems there. It seems to speak about slaves and owning and having them as a possession. And this isn't Sam Harris speaking. This is the Bible. This is the Revised Standard Version. So what are we going to say? There seems to be a problem, at least at first look. The problem is this. Bible translations talk of slaves, the Old Testament makes no objection to having slaves, and in the New Testament, Christians aren't told those who own slaves are not told to free them, and in fact, slaves are told to submit. Therefore, biblical texts approve of slavery. Fifthly, we know that slavery is wrong, therefore, biblical texts approve of something that's wrong. Now, does anyone here in this ever so sound conference feel the force of that argument? Does anyone feel the force of that argument? Anyone at all? No one. No one. One person. Is that all we get? Two people. Three. Four. Five. A few. Well, let's go through this. Let's begin by looking at the subject of translation. The interesting thing is that when we go back to the King James Version, there are only two occurrences of the word slave in it. Once in the Old and once in the New Testament in the book of Revelation where it's clearly disapproved of. Newer English translations have added um, or have more occurrences of the word slave. So the New King James, the NIV, the New Revised Standard Version have many more occurrences. The Jewish Publication Society, the JPS translation, just an Old Testament, of course, back in 1917 just had three occurrences of this word. By the time they revised it in 1985, they had 135. It's not just that this happened in English, it also happened in the German Bible translations, where you have a very similar word in a masculine and feminine form. In the Luther Bible, right up to 1912, there was no occurrences of this word. When they revised it in 1984, there were 70. Not just in German, it works in Spanish as well. That the older translation in Spanish, the Reina Valera translation, had four occurrences of this word in its masculine or feminine forms. As it was revised, more and more occurrences came up. And this has happened in a whole number of languages, in fact. And I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think rather people are trying to make a more contemporary sounding translation. They get rid of words like manservant and maidservant and things that sound a little bit odd like that. And so this is what's gone on. 
But it does at least raise the question of what's the right way we should translate it. Let's consider what went on in Jeremiah 2 verse 14, where the King James Version said, is Israel a servant, using the Hebrew word eved, and then when it needed a second word for the second phrase, said, is he a home-born slave? But it's in italics because there's no Hebrew word in the original. That's the one occurrence of the word slave in the King James Old Testament. By the time it gets revised in the New Revised Standard Version of 1989, the two words are switched round. The word slave has become the equivalent of the Hebrew word. Now this word, eved, is not such a negative word. Here is a man who was actually one of those, a minister of Jeroboam II. Um, And this is his seal, Shema. He says, I'm Shema, and he's very proud to be a servant of Jeroboam. It's a title of honor. Moses only gets called a servant of the Lord once he's dead. Joshua only gets called a servant of the Lord once he's dead. In fact, this word, it gets translated nowadays, both servant and slave, but it's not inherently negative. It really relates to work and to being subject to someone else. The problem is this. When we read the Old Testament, we need to remember that New World slavery and Roman slavery hadn't happened. So we've got to factor out those entirely from our minds before we read the text in order to understand what's going on. Everyone in the Old Testament is a subject, including the king who is the subject of God. What's really going on when we look at the patriarchs is they're not working in, uh, they don't have servants working in chains in cotton fields. In fact, their servants will inherit. Uh, Eliezer of Damascus will inherit what Abraham has if Abraham produces no child. The children of his second tier wives, and having second tier wives is a bad idea, um, uh, they will inherit. These servants are trusted with weapons. They're trusted to go off with valuables. There isn't an approved selling of people. The selling of people is Joseph's brothers doing it, which is a bad idea again. When we compare what's going on in the New Testament with Roman slavery and New World slavery, we see something completely different. The Bible, they have holidays. They're given enough food. They have access to the city gate. Everyone has access to the city gate. And there are very strong rules on sexual behavior. Can they be kidnapped? No, that's a capital offense. Put in chains. The first mention of people in chains in the Hebrew context is in the apocryphal book of Ecclesiasticus, not in the Old Testament. Can they be tortured or physically abused? If you so much as knock a tooth out of one of your servants, you have to let them go free of obligation. And if they would like, to run away you let them you shall not give up to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you he shall dwell with you in your midst in the place that he shall choose within one of your towns wherever it suits him which is a rule that the Romans didn't run with and nor did the antebellum south what we're talking about when we're talking about buying and selling is not the sort of thing that um, we necessarily mean by buying and selling in quite the same way. We might talk about buying and selling um, computer software, but you don't buy computer software. Actually, technically, you lease it. What I think is going on is particularly debt servitude or slavery. You're in a subsistence society. That means you, you might have nothing to live on other than what you work for. Let's say your ox dies. You become very poor. Well, the Lord commands your Israelite neighbors to supply you with food, but let's say they don't. The only thing you can do is pledge your future work for some food now. And I think that's what's going on here. People sell themselves or they sell their daughters, not because they're trying to cash in on their daughters and get as many camels as they can for their beautiful daughters, but rather because there's always a financial transaction with a marriage. The groom pays bride price to the bride's father and the bride's father gives a dowry to the wife. If the man runs away from her, she gets to keep the dowry. It's a new financial uh, establishment. So we're talking about actually leasing and work. But the objection might go that... Well, even in the Old Testament, it doesn't seem right. But then we're helped by the fact that at at the beginning of creation, it wasn't that way. Job will talk about how the one who made him his servant in the womb also made his servant. Did not he who made me in the womb also make him? Did not one fashion us in the womb? We are also helped by the fact that our Lord, when he was asked about divorce, could say that The laws about divorce in the Old Testament were actually not 
saying divorce was a good thing, they were regulating something. And that gives us a resource to understand that polygamy in the Old Testament is not a good thing, and also servitude. The same logic applies to both. Jesus goes with the question of divorce back to the very beginning. In the beginning, there was no divorce. In the beginning, God made the male and female. That's how it should stay. In the beginning, there was no dominion of one human over another. There was no polygamy, multiple wives, and so on. Both apply. So what we have in the Old Testament sometimes is regulation. Now, the fact that someone draws up regulation about gambling doesn't mean they think gambling's a good idea. It just means that they're trying to seek limits to that. But the objection might go, doesn't the New Testament allow slavery? Well, of course, we need to remember that the New Testament people had no vote, so there's no point Paul writing to them about the ideal and political system. What's more, slaves who rebelled would be executed, rather like in the film Spartacus. But even, could you say, could Paul say to his congregations, masters, free all your slaves? Actually, the problem was there, there were legal limits on freeing slaves. You can't just free every slave that you have. When you die, you could free, if you had 30 slaves, you were only allowed to free 10. If you had three slaves, you could only free two. So in other words, to say just free all slaves like that wouldn't be legally possible. But we can say that the New Testament teaches that we should love others as Christ loved us, which rather does do away with slavery. Then the Christians introduced the word of the language of brotherhood and sisterhood, that is, we are all a family. Then they have a vigorous kissing campaign. What I mean by that is that not just in Paul's letters but also in 1 Peter there is mention of the holy kiss. Now some people in Britain like to say that this was just part of their culture rather like the British handshake. The problem is it was not part of their culture that Jews should kiss Gentiles or that masters should kiss slaves. That would actually have been deeply scandalous. So the point is this, whom do you kiss? You kiss your siblings. You kiss family. If we're going to have a holy kiss at this conference, the first thing you need to do, of course, is to start by kissing the people you least want to kiss. We also have, within the New Testament, language of equality in the way that um, so, uh, masters are to treat their servants, not even threatening and treating them equally to themselves. And Philemon is told to accept Onesimus as above a slave, a beloved brother. And then what is the thing that you have to do in order to be saved? Well, you have to confess that Jesus is Lord, which is exactly the same as saying Jesus is master. So although they couldn't do away with slavery legally, the point is they are going around saying Jesus is master, Jesus is master. Have you accepted Jesus as your master? More briefly, the question of sexism. The Bible is just politically incorrect. Sorry, can't do anything about that. There are more than 3,000 named characters in the Bible. Fewer than 150 of them are women, which gives us fewer than 5% of named characters in the Bible being women. Sorry, don't try and make the Bible egalitarian. I I don't even bother. I just think you're going to be defeated. However... What we can say when we ask the consistency question, we ask people to be consistent, is that actually our culture is rather strange on the subject of sexism as well. People want to maintain there's no difference between the sexes except they have different rules for what you do in Olympics from everything else. Or they say that in Britain you can be struck off a medical register for giving counselling in relation to someone's perceived sexual attra- feelings of sexual attraction, but on our National Health Service, you can be given for free a gender ch- uh, reassignment change. So in fact, what our society is saying is that gender is very flexible and sexuality, so-called, is very fixed. We also find that within our world today, there are certain places where gender side is going on through abortion. That is, vast numbers of uh, uh, more more, uh, female uh, children are, are killed in the womb than male. And what do you think of the real value of women? Actually, we find secularism has problems here, because it does not assign an absolute value to women. What the Bible gives us is a wonderful balance. Here's an example text in 1 Peter 3 verse 5. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honour 
And wives do, do like to be honored to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, for most of uh, my parents' lives, my father has been stronger than my mother. But just at the moment, my mother is stronger. I don't think that's something that this text is denying. It's making a generalization. But then it makes this comment, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. So in other words, there is that sense of the joint inheritance, the inheritance at the same level, they are heirs with you. So the Bible maintains difference between male and female. It's not trying to flatten everything out, but also it maintains an equality of value. We could also say that the Bible has a huge emphasis on the amazing contribution of women to the messianic line, not just through the procreative process, but that included when we find a number of times that the messianic line was nearly cut off and key women played a role in making sure it was not, whether it's, it's, it's Esther or Jehoshaphat who managed to hide the King Joash and so on. Women's obedience uh, to God and even sometimes disobedience played an absolutely key role. Some people say, well, why are more men mentioned in the Bible? I say, well, look at the Gospels. Who comes off better, men or women? <laughs> Go figure. So a common atheist way, a common secularist way, is to say that actually, when we get down to it, people are just an assembly of chemicals. So in fact, they only differ in the area of reproduction. A Christian view is that women and men are of infinite worth because they're made in God's image and are of an example of divinely created variety. Why should we be more ashamed of that view? We have a far higher view of women than any secularists out there. In fact, I think secularism has an even lower view of women than Islam. Although I not, I'm not, maybe a bit dicey on that. I need, need to talk to some others. But I'm not an expert on that, and I'm not doing apology for Islam. I just think secularism has a really low view of women. So just to recap, last slide. Use scripture. Questions may be a good idea. We should seek people to be consistent and committed. And of course, we need to be consistent and committed in a conversation. There's absolutely no point doing this if we are not ourselves that. We need to love these people and we need to be committed. Let's also remember, it's not a technique. This is all God's work. You can have all your arguments right and nothing will be achieved. Absolutely zip. People aren't saved by good answers. We are called to love people and to pray for them and to remember it is the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit that brings people to conversion. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you do help us understand your word. Sometimes it's very difficult. And we ask that when we don't understand it, we would nevertheless trust. We recognize that you are supremely trustworthy and we ask that you will give us opportunities to share your word with people. We ask that we would not shy away from things that seem to be difficult, but that we would trust and that you would, through us, bring many to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Without you, we can do absolutely nothing. We cannot reach anyone. And we just ask that you, through this conference and through your word in our lives, would prepare us and use us for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.